All right, we're going to go ahead and start with some review, try to catch everybody up, okay? Uh, because we know that lives are busy, so when we start a Bible study, we know what happens. It's hard to stay consistent week in, week out. And so what we try to do is catch is do each lesson that can stand on its own, but at the same time connect it to the whole book. Uh, because we do, when we read a book of the Bible, we do need to know its context, its history, and those kind of things, um, lest we misinterpret it. Um, so let's just catch up, first of all, in the big picture, and then we'll look in the book itself. Zechariah means, his name means, one who Jehovah remembers. And that's kind of the theme of the book, is that God is remembering his people. And so there's others with this name in the Old Testament, um, but we're sticking with the prophet Jer uh, Zechariah. Now, the historical context is that in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian invaded Judah for the third time, and he exiled the people of Israel from this, the nation of Israel, which was called Judah at the time, to uh, a place in Babylon. And then after that, in 536 B.C., Cyrus the Persian, who took over the Persian kingdom and defeated the Babylonians, his policy was to release the Israelites to return back to the land of Israel and rebuild their temple and begin to live there. And so 70 years had gone by from the first invasion of, of Nebuchadnezzar in 605 B.C. until the first wave of people who went back to Israel. Now, only about 50,000 people out of about a million actually went back. And so the, the lion's share of the people of Israel stayed in Babylon and were sprawled throughout the Persian Empire. And history tells us that the Jews carried great influence throughout the whole Persian reign. Uh, they, they really did have a lot. They had sporadic persecution, but pro by and large, uh, they were very prominent, as we saw in the book of Esther. Um, we saw that she was rose to power and others rose to power, and that's pretty indicative of what happened. But periodically, like in Haman and Esther, uh, they were persecuted. So about 50,000 people, a little bit more than that, returned under a governor named Zerubbabel, and they started to build the temple of God as soon as they got there, but they got resistance from the locals who were accusing them of insubordination and sedition, and the work on the temple was stopped. About 15 years goes by, and then God raises up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to encourage Zerubbabel and the leaders of the, of the remnant people that are living in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem area in Israel, called Palestine. They, they stir them up spiritually to begin to rebuild the temple. Now, the book of Zechariah covers this time period, of the time period right before they began to rebuild and then messages after the rebuilding. That's why the book is divided into two sections. You see up here on the whiteboard, chapters 1 through 8 are messages that were spoken, and they're actually dated, so we know this, before the rebuilding of the temple began. Now, I don't mean the rebuilding in 536. I mean the rebuilding around 522 B.C. After the delay, Zechariah gets messages from the Lord to encourage them to rebuild the temple. Those are the messages in chapters 1 through 8. And then we saw that the second section, and we're just beginning that tonight, is chapters 9 through 14 are messages that take place, are given after the temple's rebuilt. And those messages, the theme of those messages is different than the themes of the messages in the first section. In the first eight chapters, the messages are basically all the one and the same message which is even though they're manifested in different ways, the message is God is saying to his people, the time of restoration and rebuilding and blessing has come. The former mistakes of the past have been forgiven. The situation that you were in, in the past where you were under great oppression is over. I am now looking at Israel and the remnant of God's people and the nation of Israel with, with the determination to bless them. And that is the message of Zechariah that it's time to build, it's time to move forward, it's time to leave the past behind, it's time to reflect on how you got where you are, and remember that it was idolatry and disobedience that got the people of Israel into captivity in the first place, but it's time to leave that mourning and sorrow behind and begin to move into what God has for them. How many else want coffee? <laughs> Taking orders? Three sugars and a creamer, please? Some people are spoiled. And he sits right up front for everybody to see, to make everybody jealous. 
<laughs> Must be nice. My wife never brings me anything special like that. So, so I'm just teasing. She does wonderful. My wife, I've married up. If I give her too much credit, she wants a raise. Zechariah has a series of eight visions in one night, and it's all one night. And chapter one, we, I could give you the verses, but you should have this in, in any kind of um, table of contents in, in any study Bible. But the first message is uh, a man riding a red horse. The second one is four horns and four craftsmen. Then there's a vision of the surveyor. Then there's a vision of Joshua, the high priest, being dressed in filthy garments. Then there's a vision of the temple will be finished under Zerubbabel. Uh, sinners will be purged from the land, and sin will be purged from the land. These are all the messages we find in the first eight visions, and I'm going very quickly over that. But those are pretty basic messages. Even though the symbology can be a little bit tough, the message is it's time to rebuild. The message is, is God's going to bless your efforts to rebuild. Okay, That's really the essence. And all the symbology is pointing there. Now, when we get into the second section, I'll be honest with you, this is some of the hardest symbolism in the Old Testament. You know, and so I've studied many parts of the Bible. I've read through the Bible many times from cover to cover. I still struggle with some of the imagery here in the next five chapters. And one of the things I'm doing, what I do with Digging Deeper, is basically what you're getting is, is these are my studies. These are my ongoing studies as I study parts of the Bible. And I just throw out what I'm learning. But it's not, it's not been studied to articulate it well. I've not fine-tuned it. I've not made final decisions on what I believe. Like I could teach this next year and disagree with some of the things I'm saying right now because what I'm just giving you is overflow of my just studying. I like to be studying a book of the Bible all the time. Okay, And so this is, this is the one I'm studying. And so I still am working on some of this stuff. And so I'm, I'm going to give you a 30,000-foot view without drilling down on a lot because some of these texts we could stay in for a while and really go all over the place, and I don't want to do that. I'm trying to get the 30,000-foot view for myself. That's what I'm giving you, and hopefully it will help you. Um, there's plenty of books out there that have been written on the subject, but I also want, in these classes, I want to model for people how I study because I have very good, and I'm not bragging, but I have very good study habits. And my wife will tell you, I've been doing this a long time, and I really work towards finding out what the Scripture says, not what the commentary says it says and trying to avoid, you know, just taking an opinion because it's my favorite teacher or whatever. I don't want you to take my opinion. I want you to learn how to study, you know, because you may study some things I never get to, and you may know more about that subject than I ever will, okay? But if you have good study habits, it can help. So that's one of the things I try to model as we, we approach these things. And so the message of before rebuilding the temple is to encourage God's people to move on with the rebuilding. The messages after are going to bring us to the time of Christ and what God's going to do with the Israelites between the time of the rebuilding and the time of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And some things, some scholars believe, are what they call eschatological, where they even point to the end days. And that's where we get into a lot of debate. Because, you know, it's easier to interpret things that have already happened than to be able to interpret things that have not happened. Okay, It's much easier to, after the fact. And so I'm going to start tonight by reading. I don't know how many of you have ever experienced or even believe in prophecy, but in my life I have met a couple, only a couple. I've met many people, I'll say many, but I've met several people who thought they were prophets and really they just eat too much pizza. Uh, they really don't hear from God. I've met people think they hear from God and they really don't. And I've told them, you don't really hear from God, you know, you know like you need to deal with this. But I've also, and I do it tactfully and nicely, but I'm saying there's people who think they really do and they're not. But I've also met a couple in my life that, man, if they told me the sun's going to come up in the west and set in the east, I would believe them. And one is Harold Eberly, who's been here a couple times, because I've watched him, I've watched the Lord tell him things about people up to probably about 75 or 80 times now. And it's just amazing the detail that, that he's able to hear and see. Um, and when he was here last, he spoke prophetically over the church. And here's what I want you, I, I already know this. I didn't need Harold to tell me this. But when a man of God like him shares this, it's very affirming and it helps me as a leader. I never lived my life by it. But I like to see if the prophetic word and what's on my heart or what's on people's hearts aligning. And basically where we are as a church is we are right now where Zechariah was and the people of Israel was. At the, before the rebuilding of the temple. That's where we are. 
You know, we had our first generation that built, you know, 86,000 square feet of building, had a lot of impact in our region. And then we got into a maintenance mode where just the things we built began to take over the daily operations. And we had to restructure. And we had to move from the first generation to the second generation. And guys, those are big transitions in a church. And then we've restructured and God has helped us restructure. And now where we are is the Spirit of God saying it's time for Eagle's Nest to begin to build. Now, when I say build, I don't mean more buildings. I mean build out what God wants to do in the first place. And so, you know, we've talked about this faith-based uh, living facility that we're engaging a, a Christian group in building here. We're not going to pay for it. We're not going to run it. They're interested in putting one here. They have to raise the money. That's the next challenge is if they can capitalize it. And that means pay for it. They have the money to pay for it, but they don't spend their money. You know how it works in companies. They're going to go to the banks, and that has to align. And so up to this point right now, is there is a 120-bed assisted living facility being designed right now to go on this property. But I don't want us to go out in this message to go out into the mainstream yet because it may not happen. There's always a chance it may not happen. Now, I believe it's of the Lord. And we're just kind of waiting and seeing... <laughs> As the door, because this, if this happens, it ain't going to be because of Bob. This is a huge project. Ten years ago, or 15 years ago, when our founding pastor tried to do this, it, they, they couldn't make it happen. It's on the drawing board, has been for over a decade, but couldn't make it happen. I didn't draw it, now somebody wants to do it for us. I say, hey, you know, and so, and there'll be benefits to the church and to the community. It'll be a win win for everybody. Um, but prophetically, uh, this is what the Lord said through Harold, and you'll just have to decide whether you think that Harold's a nut or whatever, if I'm a nut for listening to him. But I prove everything, and uh, here's, what here's what he said. Something's changed in the spirit for this people. There was an authority breakthrough where now you have been lifted up and things are bowing. Now, his message he was talking about when Jesus becomes Lord, things bow. Uh, because they are bowing, because my spirit is manifesting the Son in his presence, they bow. But now as things come into alignment, and that is what is happening, we, are, we have been working on getting things aligned here so that we're moving together in the same direction. Serve, serve. Now, we have three practices, worship, connect, serve. We are focusing on a do-good initiative this year, which you'll be hearing more about. So he, he didn't know any of this stuff, but we are focusing on serving our community. Our mission statement is to, to serve our community by doing good, building relationships, and making fully devoted followers of Christ. There will be no stop to where I'm taking you. There will be no limits to the blessings. And he who seeks me first, to him all things that are needed will be added. The wealth that you need, the people that you need, the help that you need, the advice that you need. The banks will align, the radios will align, the newspapers will align, because I've given you a new level of authority. And now in the Spirit, there's been an inversion, and I've lifted you up and postured you in a place of authority now. Now, if you remember back in January, I preached what was the first 10-year mission was to reposition this church. This man doesn't know that. He wasn't here. We have been postured. We've been positioned now for what God wants to do in the next 10 years. Um, let me pick up where I left. And now in the Spirit, there's been a version of serve, serve, serve. And you will see a tremendous harvest from this day forward. This I have done among you, says the living God. And I warred with you, and I wanted a people. In my heart was a people. In the midst of your warring, I have been able to create a people. And I have been able to posture shepherds and people who are willing to die and give their lives and eliminate hirelings. In other words, people that just want to make money on ministry. I've been able to create love. And I'm now in a place to release the dynamic, the dyna the, the dynamic that I want to release everywhere where my people gather. Take another step. Take another step. And know you're seated in a higher place with me. And nothing can take away the ground that you've now attained. Now, in essence, simply put, it's the same message that Zechariah was receiving to speak to the people of God. Is when we went through all those chapters in the first eight chapters, he's saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to increase you. I'm going to help you build the temple. I'm going to help you. He's going to talk about chapter nine. I'm going to help restore the government. And he's saying the things that you need are going to begin to go forward instead of backwards. That's all the Lord's telling us, is that go forward. I'm going to be with you in these things. Now, I believe, personally, it's just a living facility. But if it comes back and they say, we're not, it, it can't happen, 
then we'll get back on the drawing board. We're gonna, we've got 78 acres of land we're going to use to bless our community and minister to our community. We'll figure something out. It doesn't scare me because I know if God is in it, he's going to make sure we get where we... We just have to keep moving forward. That's what God was saying to Zechariah is the time is over. There's been an inversion it, where it was hard... Now it's going to be easier. Where it was heavy, it's going to be lighter. Where, where you worked hard and got little, now you're going, to, you're going to work hard, but you're going to get much. There's going to be return. This is really the essence of the book of Zechariah, and I believe that's exactly where we are as a church. It's an exciting time because you're going to begin to see things that we've talked about for years beginning to manifest. We have to stay in step. We have to be humble. We have to be teachable. We have to recognize that no one has a hotline to heaven where they see everything or know everything. We're going to have to learn from, another, from each other, and we're going to have to do community at a higher level. But I promise you, with a money-back guarantee, the Lord is moving in our midst, and things are, about, things are shaking loose and beginning to happen. So it's very exciting. So this book of Zechariah, I wanted to kind of do it because it, at the right time, and this is the right time. And so we pick it up in chapter 9. Uh, under the leadership of Zerubbabel, the prophet Zechariah, and the messages of restoration. We pick it up in chapter 9. Any questions on anything I've said before I go into this, or even the prophecy or whatever, and what, any questions anybody has on that, I'll be glad to answer those questions, because I, this stuff is familiar to me, and so I can't think sometimes of what's unfamiliar to others. The, all the land, yeah, the building of the. So we own. We own seventy-eight a- acres. Okay, so we're going to be selling the land. We're not going to sell any land. We're going to lease land. We will not give up any land. You can give up. Okay, I figured you get like two and a half fifty thousand an acre. I I don't know. I don't know any of the details yet. The, we're not going to sell any land. We'll lease land if we get into agreement with them because that'll give us the capacity to control the quality of care. It'll also give us an ongoing <coughs> income stream that we can help pay bills and give, have money coming in. Mm-hmm. Yes. But, but as far as the details go, I can't give you the details because where we are with that right now is they're, out, they're, drawing, they're drawing the first phase and where it will be on our property. And then from there, it has to be capitalized, which means the banks have to be willing to give, you know, like when you build a house, you have to get a loan, that kind of thing. One, if that goes through, and I believe it will, especially if Harold's hearing from God, then that'll be when we get into the nitty-gritty and start getting down to the details and I'll have more specific information. They have cautioned us, even though it's very optimistic, like all the market studies say it's robust and it's a great idea. Uh, they've cautioned us not to say too much to the congregation because they don't want people to be deflated if something bad happens because they've done this before and things can happen. It can be delayed. It can be you know, resisted. You know, we are in Sussex County. You know, progress is moving backwards slowly. Um, so, you know, there are things that can go wrong. But, what, but even if things go wrong, remember, I, what I believe God's saying to us is move forward. I'm with you. Don't, don't be discouraged. Like they, the first time they built the temple, they got discouraged. They had problems and they quit. I'm here to tell you, anything you do for God is going to require some kind of resiliency that you have to just keep moving forward. All right? And so we'll give you the information as we get it. Um, but I'm just saying on a human level, on a spiritual level, it seems like everything's a green light and we're just going to keep moving forward until the Lord starts showing us a yellow or red light. And as that happens, I'll, I will be sure to communicate with all of you. But I'm sharing a little bit more with you guys because this is a more intimate group. You guys are stepping up to study and learn a little bit. So I'm giving a little bit more information that I will give on Sunday mornings because it's a small enough crowd that if you guys have questions, you can ask me. I do it on Sunday morning. I spend all Sunday afternoon trying to answer questions, you know? So we're trying to go, we're trying to go cautiously. All right, so chapter 9. We have just read through the first eight chapters, which the, le- the last chapter ends with God telling them to no longer celebrate or to focus on the fast days, which are signs of mourning. But in chapters, chapters 7 and 8, he tells them that their, new, their fasts are now going to become joyous celebrations, and it's basically saying the same thing is the time of mourning is over, the time of rejoicing and blessing has come. And we pick it up in chapter 9. It starts in verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord against the land of Hadrach, 
and Damascus is resting place. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are, are, are on the Lord. Also against Tamath, which is borders on it, and against Tyre and Sid Sidon, though they are very wise. Now, he starts out in, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, he's talking about the coming of a king. In fact, there's a coming of two kings that are actually announced here. The coming of Alexander the Great, and then a contrast, the coming of the Messiah. Now, I'll explain that as we go, all right? But this is why it gets confusing, because much of the prophecy in the Old Testament is what they call typological. There's a physical fulfillment, a fulfillment in what we call the real world, and that's the message that the prophet's speaking, but it also has an application that points to the Messiah, Jesus, and a later fulfillment. And that's why sometimes it gets a little confusing, because in one sense, they're saying two things at once, all right? And that's why it's hard, and even scholars who study this stuff all the time have a hard time dialing it in sometimes. Sometimes it's easy to see, sometimes it's not. Zechariah is a little bit harder prophet sometimes to dial it in. Some of the other prophets are pretty easy, but, but he can be a little confusing sometimes. But the context here is the nation of Syria. Now, the Bible is so not relevant to today because nothing's happening in Syria today that the Bible would speak to. I mean, you know. This is right, this is, this is in our news today. Not exactly what he's prophesying, but maybe he is. I mean, I don't know how far it applies sometimes. But these are the, this is the area of the world that he's talking about. Hadrach was a city near Damascus. We don't know exactly where. Damascus is the capital of Syria. And he's saying that the burden of the, anytime you see the burden of the Lord and the prophets, that's not a good message. That means judgment's coming, okay? Now, he's been very positive up to this point. All eight, all eight chapters have been, have been very positive. Now, he's speaking of burden to, to Syria. And the reason he's doing that is when Syria is judged, God's people will be relieved. And that's another thing we have to remember when you're reading the prophets. You know, there's sometimes a doom and gloom stuff that we think is doom and gloom is actually good news. See, it's doom and gloom for the enemies of God, but it's good news for the people of God who the people that are harassing them are going to be judged. They're going to be delivered. So he's saying it's a burden. It's a burden on Syria, but it's great news for Israel. Okay? Same way with the book of Revelation. You know how much I talk and teach about that. The book of Revelation is one of the most optimistic books in the Bible, and people miss it because they're pessimistic. But for God's people, the message is, hey, the future's bright. I want to deal with your enemies. For the enemies, it's not so good. So, But if you read it just in the context that often is presented, it seems like God's out to get people. No, God's delivering his people from the oppression they're under. And so that's how you have to kind of read the prophets. You have to be sure of the context. So he's talking about the nation of Syria. He's saying judgment will come upon the nation of Syria. This was fulfilled by Alexander the Great, these first two verses. You see, Damascus, he says, is the resting place. It's the capital. And see, when, when Alexander the Great, remember the, the history that we're reading right now, the time in which we're, we're, this prophecy was given, is it's about um, 522 to 515 B.C., Alexander the Great is going to rise 330-ish B.C. He's going to conquer the whole known world, and then he's going to die. Okay, he dies a young death. That's prophesied in Daniel, Daniel chapters 7, 8, and, 7, 8, and 9, 7, and 8, and a couple other places in Daniel. But the idea is the prophet's looking down, and he's saying, eventually this king's going to come, and he's going to deal with Syria. This didn't get fulfilled right away, and he's now prophesying future stuff. And we know most of the scholars that I've read say that this was fulfilled in Alexander the Great. And truthfully, I didn't bone up on this time period history because I didn't have time. But when you study this time period of history, some of these prophecies will come more to light when you find out exactly what Alexander did. He, and, and Nebuchadnezzar and these guys, they literally fulfilled prophecies to the letter. Okay? Sometimes the prophecies were hundreds of years like this one, a couple hundred years in advance. He says there's going to be judgment on Tyre and Sidon, which we know was fulfilled. Uh, Tyre and Sidon was judged under Nebuchadnezzar. But Tyre and Sidon are two towns just outside of the land boundary of Israel at the time. And they were considered like Israel's, not arch enemies, but what's the term for um, when you're, you, you're somebody you don't like, they don't like each other? Nemesis and competitors. And they had like a hostile relationship. So Tyre and Sidon, Jesus said, Jesus told his people, woe to you, Bethsaida, if the miracles have been done in you, have been done 
in Tyre and Sidon, he said they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Gee, that's an insult. Jesus is insulting him. He's saying, if the miracles I had done among you, if I had done in your enemy's camp, they'd have repented and come to God. So because Tyre and Sidon, was, well, there was a competition between them. They are actually the capital of the Phoenicians, who were the mistresses of the Medi Mediterranean for about a thousand years. Um, that's a whole other story. They were supposed to be conquered by the Israelites, but they never conquered them. And that's another story too. But he's predicting now that Tyre and Sidon was going to have a judgment. That's interesting because Tyre and Sidon were judged under Nebuchadnezzar, but there was two Tyres, two cities of Tyres. One, one was on the mainland, but then another one got moved to, the, to like an island just outside of, of the mainland, and it was considered impregnable, meaning they couldn't have kids. <laughs> no, what it means, they, they felt like they could never be destroyed because how do you get to them? Well, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they prophesy one level of judgment against Tyre. Now, Zechariah is prophesying another, which is going to be fulfilled under Alexander the Great. And so this city is going to experience another judgment. It's, but it's interesting that, you know, that this city that was wicked comes under ultimate judgment, but it took a number of years. And so he's saying that Israel's enemies and nemesis are going to be dealt with. Now, for them, that's bad news, but for Israel, it's good news. For Tyre, he says in verse 3, built herself a tower, heaped up silver like the dust, and gold like the mire of the streets. Tyre was very wealthy because it was, it was a merchant city. Ships from all over the world would go to Spain and go to Egypt and go to Italy and go all throughout the Mediterranean and trade. And through that trade, they became very wealthy. Ezekiel chapter 26, I think it is 26 and 27, talk about the king of Tyre. And it pictures a ship and it describes a ship that was built. And some people believe that it's speaking of the fall of Satan. Other people don't believe that's the case. But Tyre is a very prominent city known for its wealth and, and its trade in slaves, trade in gold and silver and all kinds of precious things. But, but they were wicked through trade. Then you see that same in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 18. Revelation 18 is almost a mirror image of Ezekiel 26 and 27, talking about the fall of Tyre. But it's contextualized. Now, the prophet Zechariah here is saying, hey, this wealthy city who thinks that she's, nobody can touch her is going to fall, and the oppression she brings to you is going to be lifted. This is another encouraging message to the Israelites. Remember, he's restoring them. He's saying, I'm going to restore. Now he's basically saying a similar thing as he said in the book of Revelation. I'm going to deal with your enemies. Now, think about it from business, Okay. If you're, I used to be in the printing business. I started my own printing company years ago. And let's say that, that I'm a small printing operation and I have a company that keeps stealing business from me. And then God speaks a word and says, Thus say it the Lord, Bob, printer Bob. I'm going to put such and such company out of business. <coughs> Is that good news or bad news? It's great news for me, isn't it? I'm going to remove your competitor. That's basically what he's saying here. I'm going, to, I'm going to create an environment for you where you can have success. I'm going to create an environment for you where you prosper and do well. That's what he's really doing. It's in prophetic <laughs> language, and, and we have to kind of understand that, or it, or it does sound pretty negative. He says, but the Lord will cast her out. He will destroy her power in the sea. The reasons in the sea is they're merchants through the sea, and also their capital is now a lake in the middle of the Mediterranean. And she will be devoured by fire. Now, you could go throughout history and commentaries, and they'll explain how these were fulfilled in Alexander the Great, but I don't really want to spend that time in that detail, so I didn't bother to record it. But it is in various commentaries. Then he goes into speaking about the Philistines. Now, the Philistines, in verse 5, anybody remember what the Philistines, who the Philistines were? They were friends of Israel, right? Like buddies. <laughs> Samson destroyed the Philistines. So they were other enemies. See, when you study the map, Israel was surrounded by enemies. The Philistines were in the area of Gaza. There was five cities, Gaza, Ashkelon, uh, Ekron, a couple others. can't remember off the top of my head. It's too late in the day. Uh, but these five cities, they, they were like a thorn in the side of the people of God. You know, we hear about Gaza today, right, on the news? 
There's still problems there. The only thing that's changed is the names. Okay, same problems. They're like a thorn in the side. And he's saying, now he says, Ashkelon, so see it. Ashkelon is a city of the Philistines. Gaza, also a city of the Philistines, shall be very sorrowful. And Ekron, I mentioned that city as well. For he dried up her expectation. The king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. He's saying that not only will this coming king destroy Syria, he's, and to take care of Tyre, he's going to deal with He's going to deal with the, with the Philistines. This did happen under Alexander. It says, Gaza was taken by Alexander, 10,000 of its inhabitants slain, and the rest were sold as slaves. The Bedus, the satrap, or petty king, was bound to a chariot by thongs, thrust through the soles of his feet, and dragged around the city. Now, guys, I'm here to tell you, when Alexander and those guys did stuff, they didn't mess around. For the Israelites, that's good news. He goes on to say, A mixed race shall settle in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. He's basically saying the same thing. Uh, I didn't write down what the mixed race refers to, but it does refer to something. Um, but basically saying the peoples are going to be mixed in the land, which would have really ticked the Philistines off. I will take away the blood from his mouth. Now that is imagery of like a lion having prey in his mouth. And he's saying, I'm going to rip the prey out of his mouth and the abominations from between his teeth. But he who remains in the area of the Philistines, even he shall be for our God and shall be like a leader in Judah and Ekron like a Jebusite. Now, the Jebusites were, the city of Jerusalem was formerly controlled by the Jebusites. And when David came as became king, he captured the city of Jerusalem and took it from them. And so what, what the writer is saying here is that Jer just as Jerusalem was taken and made the center of Jewish religion, he's saying these Philistines will be brought into a covenant relationship with God. In other words, they're not only going to have victory, the, their enemies are not only going to be destroyed, but those that are left in the land are be, going to be converts. It'd be like God saying to us, harvest is coming. What that means is God saying, you know, you know, the work that you're working hard for to reach people is going to happen. People are going to come to Christ. He's saying it in their language. He's saying to them, you know, because back then they were the church of the world. You know, they're a mess. Is the church in the world, at least in America, a mess? Yes. We're a mess. But God's saying, you know what? I'm going to bless you anyway, and I'm going to take care of your enemies, and I'm going to give you the ability to, to win people to me, which was Israel's original mission in the first place. Israel was, uh, Israel was put in the, in the center of the world, guys, not because God liked them better than everybody else. When God's chosen people, he didn't choose them because he liked them better, and he didn't choose you because he liked you better. But you got the, you've got Israel and Egypt and Africa. Now, I am not an artist, so don't say anything. Isn't that beautiful? He basically comes around like this, okay? And now you have Turkey and you have the Aegean and the, and the seas, and then you have Italy coming in here, okay? And you have Spain, okay? Rock of Gibraltar over here. You understand? That's abstract art, okay? I could make a lot. Boy, that is, is bad, isn't it? Gosh, it looks like a, a sheep upside down. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? No, you get what I'm saying? Okay? Work with me. Abstract, John. This is probably going to be worth a million dollars and pay the building off. <laughs> so here's Israel. You have the Jordan River here, okay? And then you have the Middle East, okay? Euphrates and Tigris over here. Syria is over in this area, okay? Now, Israel was placed in the center of the world, Coming from the Middle East, coming from Europe into Africa, you had to cross through Israel. Ezekiel 5.5 5 says that Israel was the, I'm trying to remember how it says it, it was the hub, but it was like the glory of the lands. Everybody wanted it. You know why? Location, location, location. By land, you had to go through Israel 
to cross and trade. All the trade had to go through Israel. It was God's will that his people be filthy rich in the center of the world as merchants so that they could take the gospel of the Judaist, the Judaistic gospel of the Old Testament to the world. That was the goal. He also positioned them by sea. This is the, the Mediterranean. Now, to the north, Israel's boundary was up here and then all the way across to the Tigris and Euphrates River. Right inside this border was two towns called Tyre and Sidon. They never took those cities, but if they had, Israel would become mistress of the Mediterranean. Do you see the potential God did here? Puts them in the center of the world, by land and sea, going to give them the wealth to get the job done, but they became corrupted and instead went into exile. They never reached their potential. The sorriest message in the Bible is man has never reached his potential until Jesus. Jesus will reach his potential. And because he does, we will. In Jesus, we'll reach our potential. That's another message of the gospel. Now, trying to catch up where I was in thought here. Um, I was going somewhere with this. Oh, Lordy, 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 Lordy. Israel, okay. All right, it'll come to me in a minute. That's the ugliest drawing I think I've ever done. It does look like an upside down cow. What is it, everybody? Let's see. Uh, so it is upside down sheep. That's what I think. It looks like a forest. <laughs> it's all a matter of your interpretation. How does it make you feel? Now, God's saying, oh, I know what it is. God's saying, I'm going to punish all your enemies who have come in and taken you over. And now, excuse me, I'm going to give you the ability to actually fulfill your original mission. That's what he's saying by, des by destroying Syria and destroying Ashdod and the Philistines. He's saying, I'm going to create an environment for you to be successful. Just remember what got you in trouble in the first place. Guys, I'm here to tell you that's what God's saying to us as a church. I believe with all my heart. God's saying the original mission that I've given you, you're at a season now where I'm ready to fulfill it. Are you ready to move forward? I am. I've been waiting for this my whole life. Don't slow down. But don't get cocky, obey God's word, love one another, stay humble, let him do it. And you know what I'm finding? Maybe it's because I'm getting older and I don't have the energy. You know when I was 23 years old, man, I tell you what, I, if God gave me a water pistol and said, charge hell, I'd have said, come on, let's go. <laughs> now, if he gave me a water pistol and said, charge hell, I'm tired. You know, but now it's what he wants to do stuff. You know why? Because I finally figured out it's not my energy and strength. It's not by might, no by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. When we're young, we have strength. When we're older, we have brains and no energy. So God says, I'll, let me do it. So that's what he's doing. He says, I'm going to set you guys up. I'm going to take, I'm going to deal with your enemies. Verse 8, I will camp around my house because of the army, because of him who passes by and he who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them. For now I have seen with my eyes. What he's telling him is saying, guys, I'm going to protect you. And you know what? God wanted to do that all along. And he'll say in a minute, or next week, we'll talk about the reason that he didn't is simply because of their idolatry and sin. You know, uh, I'm not a prosperity gospel guy. I don't think that God wants everybody to be rich. But I don't think God wants anybody to be poor. I've never seen where poverty has ever been a blessing. You understand? But I don't think everybody's supposed to get filthy rich, okay? God wants people to have what they need. God wants people to be successful. But I've got to be careful when I say that because people go off thinking that he wants everybody to have a BMW or, or whatever, and that's not the case. But God wants people to have medicine. He wants them to have health care. He wants them to have a roof over their head. He wants them to have enough food for their... He wants you to have enough little extra over the weeks. So you can buy a half gallon of ice cream, enjoy yourself a little bit, maybe go out to a movie once in a while as long as it's clean and good. You know, God is not a tightwad, okay? Uh, but what gets us in trouble is idolatry and disobedience. 
Now, these things were fulfilled in Alexander. We know that. That's the reason I say a king is coming. Because there's no mention of a king up to this point, right? But we will now see a king. Now, here's what happens. When we read this next verse, we immediately go to the New Testament because the New Testament quotes this, speaking of Jesus. But I want you to resist that temptation first. Read it in its context, and then we'll see how it applies to Jesus, okay? So he's just told him he's going to destroy the enemy in Syria. And he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a coat, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth or land. Now, there's a transition taking place here. Is under Alexander, those first eight verses, you, you, could, you could build a strong argument were fulfilled. But Alexander was a conquering king. Alexander was a king that used force and didn't matter what he did, he was going to conquer. But now we have a, we have a king that's coming into town that's riding on a donkey. You see, the horse was a symbol of military power. So the Messiah, which is speaking of Jesus, this is speaking of Jesus, but there's a contrast. And in the Old Testament, you'll find a lot of contrast. In order to make this point, they'll contrast it with this point for clarity. Like, it's, like a, it's like a black dot on a white piece of white board. There's contrast. It makes it easy to see. And so now he's contrasting the victories that will be won for God's people because God loves them. He's going to work through history to now he's pointing down to what Jesus will do. But Jesus is not coming as a king to conquer. And this is the thing that got the Israelites in trouble. They were looking for a king that would come in, destroy the Romans, deal with all the Romans, push them out. They would rise up, rule the cabinet. See, all the disciples were thinking that they were going to get vice president and, and secretary of state and all these positions in the government when Jesus was crucified. And they were totally shocked when they nailed him to a tree because they're thinking he's going to come in, conquer, wipe all the, all the enemies of Israel out, and everything's going to be fine. But Jesus comes into town in Matthew 21, fulfilling the scripture, riding a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey, which riding a donkey meant that he's coming in peace. He's not coming in war. They totally missed this. He's, he's coming as a peaceful king. Now, we know ultimately he was coming into the city to die on the cross. Totally different than any, what Alexander did. Okay? And then the, the next few verses, verse 10 says, he's going to cut off chariot. He's going to destroy. He's going to cut off chariot, which means he's going to bring peace. The chariot was their tank of their day. Uh, he's, and the horse, which led the chariot, was a symbol of war. The battle bow shall be caught. He's going to speak peace to the nations, not war. This is the same as Isaiah said, we'll beat our, our, our swords into plowshares. When the Messiah comes, what he's going to do, he's going to bring peace to the earth. That's why when the angels came in Luke chapter 2, the angel said, peace, goodwill towards men. Now, there's not peace on the earth yet. That's going to be fulfilled in, quote, the eschatological kingdom, the end days. This is how it's going to wrap up. Jesus came the first time to die on the cross for us. He's seated at the right hand of God. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 15 says that he's going to rule until his enemies become his footstool. The last enemy he's going to destroy is death. And then the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, will return and there will be peace throughout the earth and a lot more. The future's bright. This is why I keep telling people, the world's not coming to an end. The world's coming to a beginning. Christ is going to destroy our enemies. That's good news. Isn't that good news for us? Right now, we got a lot of enemies. I'm, I'm really nervous about what's happening in our government right now. Still, the election of Trump did not solve that problem because it's bigger than the president. If people want to blame Obama, it wasn't Obama. It was all the other people, and it's us. We're voting these guys in. Trump, my hope isn't in any of them. We need an awakening in our land. Okay, We've got problems. We've got enemies. We've got Hamans in our government. I can't say who they are. I don't know. At this point, I'm so skeptical what I hear in the news. I don't know who to believe. 
I'll, show, I'll believe you when you show it me in a law. When my health insurance goes down 50%, I'll believe somebody. <laughs> Republican or Democrat at this point, I don't care. I just want my insurance to go down. Look, and we judge these guys and we get all stirred up, and the truth of it don't help anybody. Jesus came in peace, not war. We're going to have to learn to speak peace. His dominion shall be from sea to sea. Now, that, the interesting thing about that is what he's saying is the Messiah will fulfill the full potential that God has for Israel. You see, do you know the Israelites in their heyday under Solomon and David never fulfilled the mandate of reigning from the Euphrates to Egypt? I mean, that, the, the, the size, we look at Israel today, that's nowhere near the size of the possession. They're supposed to own the whole land to the Euphrates. All of Syria, all that was Israel's. They got a little sliver on the side, right? Well, the Messiah, the Christ, will not only rule that, he'll rule the world. Um, and he's saying, you're going to fulfill your destiny. So I'm trying to put it in our terms. He's saying, the destiny I had for you is going to be fulfilled. God has a destiny for your life. There are things God wants to fulfill in your life. Sometimes we know what they are, sometimes we don't. But God wants to fulfill them. Look, I'm planning out in the next 27 years of my life. If I don't make it, that's fine. When I die, if I die next year, at least I had a plan. But I'm looking for more fruit at the end of my life than all my other years put together. Because I think that's how God operates. He said, I'm going to help you fulfill your destiny. He goes on to say, also for you also because of the blood of your covenant, I will, and he's talking, the blood of the covenant there is the blood that was poured out in, in Exodus 24 when Moses wrote the book of the law they killed, a, a, they killed a cow, and they sprinkled it with blood. That's the blood of the covenant. He's not talking about Jesus here. I will set your prisoners free. God's saying, because I'm in covenant relationship with you through blood and the sacrificial system, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Oh, that waterless pit, let me see. Um, now he's talking about, in verses 11 through chapter 10, he's going to talk about the king's program, what the Messiah is going to do. And some of this is mixed, guys. And I, don't, I have to be honest with you. My, my understanding of Zechariah is not just is not poignant enough yet for me to know exactly where things, different books of the Bible I've studied more than others. Some books I can hone in and say, this is clearly this and this is clearly that. I'm still learning here on how far to go with these things. But there is a dual aspect of these things um, that I'm not quite sure how far to push. Um, but he is basically saying, I'm going to bring you freedom. I'm going to free you from the prisons that are warless pits. They used to throw people down in what they call cisterns, which are empty, rock-hewn places to, haul, to, to house water. They would become prisons. That's what he's talking about. It's also picturesque of Joseph. Remember, Joseph was thrown into a pit. Jeremiah was put down into a pit, lowered into a pit. It's a symbol of a prison. He's saying, I'm going to bring you out of prison. Now, just recap this chapter. It's consistent with the rest of the book. He's saying, I'm going to free you. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to protect you from your enemy. I'm going to give you victory over your enemies. Isn't this good news? I want this message. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you. Now, in the Old Testament, when it says double, that's kind of like prophetic hyperbole or exaggeration, double is saying you're going to be well paid for everything you've been through. I'm going to double it. I'm going to, you, you think you've gone through this? I'm going to more than compensate you for what you've been through. And here's another principle about God. When God restores something, the restoration is always better than the original. That's who God is. He promises us a great thing. Garden of Eden, first failure of man, didn't reach his potential. Garden of Eden had everything, right? Did we fulfill our potential as man? No, we blew it. When God restores the earth, it'll look a lot better than the Garden of Eden. God has the capacity to... Garden of Eden was pretty good. The new Jerusalem, it's going to be better. Okay? That doesn't mean God wants us to fail. It just means that God is able. When, when we go through things in our personal life and things get botched, you ever botch something? Don't raise your hand. Okay? When God does restore you, it'll be better than what you lost. Still have consequences. But I'm telling you, when he restores you, he, will, he can't outgive God. He's abundant in mercy. 
For I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, and raised up your sons, O Zion, being Jerusalem, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. Now, what's interesting about this prophecy is when he's prophesying this about Greece, Greece in about 500, I'm trying to remember my Greek history now, there's somewhere in along the lines of democracy, and I wish I need to reread this again because, you know, democracy started in Greece, and I tell you, some of the parallels we're going through are scary. Greece lost their democracy because of individualism. They were so individualistic that they could not come together and get their government to work. So they raised up what they called a tyrannos, a tyrant, to get things done. Because the only way they could get things done was have somebody who could bully them. <laughs> he that forgets his history is destined to what? <laughs> Oaks, we really need to be praying for our government. We really need to be, if the church doesn't get its act together, I don't see much hope for America. If the church will get its act together, I see great hope for America. It's on us. It's time to step up. It really is. And it's not politics. It's for us to be who we were meant to be, to fulfill our destiny. And I believe throughout this country, what God's doing right now, through churches throughout this country, like Eagle's Nest, he has postured them. He's positioned them. He's worked with them to rise up at this hour throughout our land. We don't have to reach all of America. We can't. We're one little dinky church and old grand spectrum of things. But if we do our part with other churches, I believe America's greatest days can be ahead of her. I'm not looking to the government. I'm looking to God's people and say, let's be the community of God in our community and let's affect and infect what's going on around us with the love and the peace and the joy and the long suffering and the goodness and the mercy of God, which will change the culture, which will change our government because our government is situated like that, that the culture affects. All we're seeing in government today is a reflection of our culture and culture comes from cult and we are a nation of idol worshipers. Now he's dealing with Greece, and he's saying Greece, who's going to become the strongest democracy ever. Alexander the Great is going to be a dictator after the Greek democracy. He's going to rule an empire that the sun never sets on. And yet God's people are going to defeat the Greeks. That's what he's saying. And you know what they did? Because back in 168, 168 roughish, you know, don't hold me to these dates, After all these things transpired, right now, while, while, the, um, while Zechariah is prophesying, Babel, Persia is in control, and they'll be in control for another 200 years. Then the Greeks will rise. He's already skipped Persia. He's into the Greeks. And then when the, when the Greeks split up in the, to four separate kingdoms, in the land of Israel, there is a... It's called the Seleucid, I always get it mispronounced, it, Seleucid Kingdom. The Syrian Kingdom will rule this part, will actually rule over Israel. The Egyptians will rule in the south. You have to understand what happens is Israel gets squeezed in the middle. But these Syrians adopt Greek culture called Hellenism. And this guy named Antiochus Epiphanes is going to seek to wipe out the, the Jews. Now, before that even happens, God's prophesying that his people will defeat the Greeks. I don't know about you, but if I'm living in 168 BC, I'm putting this prophecy on my wall. They destroy the temple, where it's where Hanukkah comes from. Okay? And then this guy Antiochus Epiphanes desecrates the temple. He's a type of the Antichrist. And yet, that's the, one of the worst periods in their history, and God's saying already, you're going you're gonna to defeat the Greeks. This is very profound, and they do. And then the Israelites rise up after that, <laughs> and the Maccabees rise up. All that history, the intertestamental period history, which most people don't read about, but it's very important what's happening. You know, They call that intertestamental period the silent years. Anybody ever hear that? God is far from silent. God is working on behalf. He's never silent. He's, we made that up. I can prove that biblically. He's far from silent. Read Luke. God speaks to, to, to Anna and Simeon. If he's silent, what's he speaking for? 
But what God's doing is this, it's, a, it's a silence of biblical books, but in those 400, 500 years, God's doing a lot for his people. And he's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you defeat the Greeks. And I wish my history was better in this time period because there's a lot that goes on here, but it's been years since I've studied that type of history. And he said, I'm going to make you like a sword of a mighty man. God's going to war. He's going to use them. And that's exactly what happened during the Maccabean, during that period. Then the Lord will be seen over them. His arrow will go forth, verse 14, like lightning. The Lord will blow the trumpet and go with whirlwinds from the south. Whirlwinds were like storms. But the picture here, the, the, the imagery here is God's presence being described in a storm. Does anybody remember when I talked about God's presence in a storm? Hmm, what book of the Bible was I studying a year ago? Let's see. Revelation, and then Ezekiel, God shows up in a storm. They call it a theophany or cloud judgment. The storm was the strongest thing they knew. And he's saying God's going to come like a whirlwind or a storm. You know, the wind blows, there's lightning and thunder. And, and God, you read Ezekiel 1, it's a real graphic picture. It's in, it's in the book of Revelation as well. God shows up in a thunderstorm to execute judgment and deliver his people. That's what this is a symbol of. A theophany was always about God executing judgment on the wicked and liberating his people. And that's a very small reference, but you'll see it all through the Old Testament and in the book of Revelation. The Lord of hosts will defend them. They shall devour and subdue with slingshots. War. They shall drink and roar as if with wine. They shall be filled with blood. They shall be filled with blood like basins, like the corners of the altar. On the corners of the altar, which was, this would be the second temple, uh, not, not, not Herod's temple, but this would be the second temple, not Solomon's temple. I, I don't know the dimensions of the altar there, but I know the one in, the, in, the, in, in the Herod's temple was quite large, like 45 feet, 48 feet in, in square, and they had these big horns on the altar. But they would pour blood on the bottom of the altar and let it drain out of the city. So he's saying basically that, that they're going to win in war. Now, this, now, when we read this language for us, this is not like real sensitive language. But you've got to put yourself, if you're living in Syria right now, how would God talk to you? See, context is so important when you read the Bible because God, when, when you're in peaceful times, God uses peaceful language. When you're in war times, look, when your kids are being murdered on the street, we just had the gas attack in Syria, okay? God loves you. I'm not sure that message is going to quite get it. There is a God over the nations. I don't understand it all. I think I know less about it now than I did when I was 25. When I was 25, I had it all figured out. I knew everything. But then I didn't even know the questions. Can anybody relate to me? I had all the answers, but I didn't know the questions. Now I'm just figuring out the questions. But basically God's saying in their language to them, in their cultural language, I was saying to the staff today as we move forward in our sandbox, and I'll be teaching you more about that on Sunday mornings, but I'm really stressing with the staff. This sandbox, where we're going, is very clearly laid out now. We know where we're going, how we're going to get there, and, and we've been praying and seeking God. He's given us clarity. So I'm drilling down on these things and saying, guys, and I said to him today, we've got to learn relevance. Now, what do we mean relevance? I don't mean by relevance that if the culture is wearing tattoos and earrings, if Pastor Bob's coming in next week with a tattoo that says, I love Patty. Okay, I would look mine. There's one that make your arms look bigger. You know? I think some Sunday I'm going to get like a tape on one, and I'm going to come and just freak people out and get like a clip on earring. Lord of God, you know. Maybe wear a scarf on my head. That's not relevance. I mean, really, wouldn't that look stupid? Do you think the young people are going to go, we want to listen to Pastor Bob because he's got some sagging tattoo on his arm. I don't want to see the one on his chest. I just don't want to see that. You know what I mean? That's not relevance. What we mean by relevance is we have to seek to understand before we're understood. In other words, instead of communicating all the time, listen. But we have to listen and learn language, words. But guys, we've got to learn culture. You guys have been missionaries. You know what I'm talking about. You can get the words. That's one level, right? But there's a whole nother level called culture. And culture defines what we say when we put words together. 
For instance, I was sharing with them last year when we went to a certain place. I won't mention it on tape, but we went to a certain place in the world last year. I was in a meeting, and, and we, had, we had a couple mistakes were made on the mission field, and the missionary on the field decided to correct us all in a group. Now, you've got to understand, Pastor Bob has a few values. One of the values is don't correct me in public. Correct me in public, man. You can say anything to me behind my desk in my room. I'm real easy to talk to. But you come out here and make an idiot of me, I'm going to have to pray not to get in the flesh. Well, that's what went on. So I went later to the missionary and told him what I thought. He had seven stitches and cast after I was done with it. <laughs> no. I was respectful, but I said, you know, when you did that, you disrespected all of us. I was studying for my doctoral class this week. I'm studying conflict resolution and cross-cultural conflict resolution. When I read that I was wrong. Because the culture I was in is a shame-honor culture. And what they said about shame-honor cultures is this. In the East, they don't believe in direct confrontation and conflict resolution. That's insulting and disrespectful. They correct in a group. So everybody can know who the person is that made the mistake, but they still correct the group. That's why we have to learn culture. Because I was the one that was wrong. But see how justified I was in myself? Because the Western culture is more direct. You got a problem with me? You want to talk to me? Right? That's Westernism, not Bible. See, they would carry out Matthew 18 different than we would. That's what he was doing. And so we got culture, but we'll go on a mission field and we will study culture. Like when we go to Indonesia, my wife and I just got our plane tickets to go to Indonesia. I'm studying, trying to figure out Indonesian culture as much as I can in you know, like a month period. Because I don't want to go over there and get myself killed because I said something stupid, which I'm very inclined to do. Okay, I'll, We'll do that to go on the mission field, but we won't do that to go down the street and talk to our neighbor. There's culture all around us. There's so, I forget what the number is, but there's like 20 or 30, maybe more now. I haven't studied in a while. Subcultures in the United States. So when we talk to people... If, we don't, if we're, we don't seek to understand, I'm going to do a whole message on this in a few weeks. If we don't seek to understand who we're talking to, they ain't hearing us. For instance, racism. Let me just get it out because I can, I can say anything to this group. I heard the best definition of racism I've ever heard, and it, it opened my eyes to why there's so much argument over it. When I was growing up, racism meant you didn't like a certain class of people. That's not what it means anymore. What it means now is you don't care about the issues that concern me. Now, with that shift of def definition and culture, there's a lot of racists running around. You understand? But we're, the language has changed. The culture has changed. And we're not relevant. So what happens is if you look right now, our culture is po it, it's, it's, it's polarized Everybody's talking, but nobody can understand what anybody else is saying, and we're just getting madder and madder. It's because we're not relevant. See, if I'm going to really have... Now, I mean, you can't, I mean, you can't go to the store every day and get you know, that analytical, but if, if we're having a conflict, first thing I'm going to do is study you. That's what, my, that's what your wife said. That's why she brought that poison coffee. Nice knowing this, Key. The more you understand, then, then you communicate, when you do communicate your point, you communicate it in their language. I'm doing this with husbands and wives and marriage counseling. Respect, responsibility, relevance are three primary values. It's totally transformed my marriage counseling. I can give people tools, because they come in every week, they come in, you know, they come in several weeks in a row. This week they're arguing about how to handle the kids, next week about how to fix the car, next week about money. You know what I began to realize? Six different problems are all the same problem. Respect, responsibility, or relevance. But they have me busy. And I solved that problem. They come back next to me. Well, Pastor Bob, we don't have to fix this problem. And I said, I gotta 
train these folks. I can't solve all their problems. What's missing? Respect, responsibility, relevance. So that's what I'm going to teach you guys over the next couple of years because that's what it's going to take for us to reach the 120,000. That's what it's going to take for us to have an international footprint is when we go to different places, we're not trying to westernize them. We're trying to bring them to Jesus, try to transform their culture. But I got news for you. Not everything in our culture is bad. Some Christians act like everything that if it's not coming from the Bible is bad. It's not. Cell phones are great. When my wife breaks down, she can call my brother. He come pick her up. <laughs> some of you got that. And it's some of the things that cultures wonder. I love Dunkin' Donuts now. The resurgence of Dunkin' Donuts is awesome. We went the other day, got a dozen donuts. My gosh, I gained three pounds in two days, but it was fun. <laughs> Culture. We were down in, um, when we were down in Florida at RCC, I thought here was rural. Oh, my gosh. They didn't have a Chick-fil-A. I couldn't get, wait to get out of there. <laughs> I mean, culture. We're cultured here compared to them. They ain't saying a whole lot. Culture. What he's saying to these people in their language, that's the, that's the prophets. That's why I believe in drilling down on the history and drilling down on the type of language. People will pull scriptures out of the Bible and with a wooden literalism. And I'm like, do you really think that that when it talks about these scorpion-like things, there's really going to be these scorpion-like things on the earth? Or maybe it's symbology. Maybe it's poetry. And see, that's how you have to understand the book you're reading. Historical narrative versus the prophets use poetry and imagery. The message is literal, but the image, it's like having a dream. You ever have a dream? You know, and you got all this imagery? And like I said before, bears, when I'm, in, when I'm stressed out, bear dreams. They're just chasing me everywhere. Yeah. So when I have a bear dream, my wife had a bear dream about three weeks ago. She never dreams. She had a bear dream. I said, and, and, and it, was, it was prophetic. It was like, I said, that dream is about me. Because you know bears and me, we get along and sleep. So I said, that's got to be it. And it was a good message. It was basically, you're gonna, it's, the bears aren't going to bother you. And I was like, I, I received that. But bear, because that's what happens when I have stress. I get bear dreams. Bears chasing me. They almost get me, but they never do. You ever have ones you try to fly and you fall out of your, you know, like all, you know, you can fly, you can't quite get high enough. All that's in imagery. Your brain is wrapping things in images. That's really kind of, maybe not exactly like, but the idea of culture and context. He's saying, guys, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you victory. The Messiah's program is in chapter nine, verses nine through the end of chapter ten, and we're going to look at that next week. Um, let me finish up here. He shows up in a theophany. That was very culturally rela relative to them. That's the language they use. Read the end of Habakkuk. Is it Habakkuk? Habakkuk or Haggai? Which one is it? One of the two. The end of it, he, he ends with a theophany. Okay? Read Isaiah 19. It's a theophany. Okay? The Lord coming in a storm. Ezekiel 1. Verse 15. The Lord of hosts will defend them. I read that verse 16, the Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be like the jewels of a crown, lifted like a banner over the land, valued, precious. A banner was a sign of military battle. It's, there's a lot of imagery there. Um, verse 17, for how great it is its goodness and how great is its beauty. Grain shall make the young men thrive and new wine the young women. In other words, they're going to have enough to eat. They're going to have plenty. And in these cultures, particularly in the Bible, blessing showed up, and we'll see this in a few weeks or next week possibly, showed up in blessing, plenty to eat, prosperity, and then judgment showed up in scarcity. You want to read the scariest chapters of the Bible, read Isaiah 3 and 4, or actually chapter 3 when he talks about famine of bread. When God judges the people, they go hungry. He doesn't want you to go hungry. He wants you to be blessed. So the context of Zechariah and this chapter is now he's moving into he's, the history is in front of him, whereas in chapters 1 through 8, it was behind him. It's a lot easier to translate and interpret that. So as we get into nine, chapter 9, 10, 11, and 12, you don't have to agree with me on the application, whether it's Alexander or not, though I am giving you the general understanding that most scholars would land on, Okay. And as we study it more in depth, we may find it off a little bit or on even more. But 
it's the general central. I'm staying in the center lane here, okay? Uh, and then, of course, we know that Jesus, it was applied to him in chapter 9, verse 9, was applied to Jesus in Matthew 21 in triumphal entry in Mark chapter 13 uh, because it is speaking, it is prophetic language about the coming of Christ, and we will see more of that in the weeks ahead.